All right, hello, Victory Church. I'm excited to be here with you guys. Um, I'm on a little bit of a delay. You guys are actually an hour behind us, but uh, even this live stream is a little bit of a delay. So I'm going to be texting Pastor Jose to make sure that you guys can hear me and that you guys can see me. And uh, while we're checking that, I just want to say a very special thank you to Pastor Chris and Heather for letting me take the time to talk to you guys about small groups. I know that they have been casting that vision with you guys for a while. And while I'm waiting on Pastor Jose, man, I'll just take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself and uh, to tell you what Chris and Heather have meant to me in my life. When I was a 17-year-old kid, I showed up at a church called Monterey Park Church of God that later became International Worship Center. And my family had never really gone to church my mom was raised in church. Her dad was a pastor. And uh, when we came as a family, Pastor Chris had just arrived as the youth pastor uh, with Heather to that church. Okay, great. I just got the text from Pastor Jose that you guys can see and hear me. So good deal. This is really weird because most of the time I'm talking to people. I'm in my sanctuary alone right now talking to a camera. So that's funny. But uh Pastor Chris and Heather showed up to my little town called Fogfield, Georgia. I'm sure none of y'all have ever heard of that unless Pastor Chris has, of course, told you about it. And uh, when I was 17, he had a drastic influence on my life. You guys know he has an infectious personality. And not only myself, but many people uh, were impacted by Chris and Heather, including my wife. Uh, We were in their youth group together. And uh, many friends of mine who... Most of are all in ministry today. Many of the people that were in the youth group with me, that were in Chris and Heather's youth group, are now serving full-time in ministry somewhere uh, all over the country, which is really powerful and says a lot about them. And I'm sure you guys have experienced that today. So the short of it is, if not for Chris and Heather Wallace, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. They've played a huge part in my life and been a huge influence and have been very important Uh, at very important times in my life. So I'm thankful. I'm honored that, man, they have confidence in me to talk to you guys. So I want to do my best. And again, if it feels a little weird, a little awkward, it's just me getting used to the camera. So bear with me, okay? And so here's what we're going to do. My time, it is 8.50. So in your time, that's 7.50. My goal is to have you guys out of here around 8.30, 8.45. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just teach some theology. I'm going to teach some stuff straight out of the scripture on why we do small groups, why small groups are important. And uh, and then at the end, if you guys have questions, we're going to address those. And he's just going to text them to me, and uh, I'll hit those at the end. And I really love Q&A. Uh, I know you guys have done the poll anywhere where you've texted in questions to Pastor Chris, and we started doing that years ago together, and that's always been a really fun thing for us. Um, so that's what we're going to do tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, so you guys ready? Obviously, you can't respond, but I'm just going to pretend that y'all are out here, you know, saying stuff back to me. So uh, let me go ahead and pray. Father, um, we love you, and we're thankful for the opportunities that technology gives to us. I believe this is one of the ways that you said we would do greater things, that we would be able to talk to a group of people hundreds and hundreds of miles away Uh, about Jesus and about small groups and about the growth of the church and why this is important. Holy Spirit, I ask you just to invade what we're doing right now, to just be in control of what we're doing right now, and to anoint your word and ask for your anointing God to teach this word, to use my words in a way that I couldn't deliver them unless you were using them. And I just ask you to do that, God, that you would pierce hearts in a way you otherwise would not, that you would help me to minister this word prophetically, that it would touch people's lives, no matter what situation they're in, exactly where they are, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me start off by saying something. Um, I always believe, and I've always said, that when you are listening to the preached word of God, that you should increase your expectations, you should increase your faith of what God wants to do in your life based on the Word. Now, we oftentimes find ourselves just being very casual about the preaching of God's Word or even the reading of God's Word. But there's a story that I I love, and to me it is the best version of a small group 
uh, in the whole Bible. And it's the story of when two disciples, after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, unknown to them, were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And this is about a seven-mile journey. And let me set this up for you, and it has a point with what I just said. These two disciples who had followed Jesus, all of his ministry, are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Jesus has already resurrected. And one of the things we find out about Jesus after his resurrection is that his physical appearance changes. And we know that because when he appeared to Mary in the garden, she didn't initially recognize him. She thought he was a gardener. Pretty powerful side thought. The garment of a gardener in the first century was incredibly similar to the garment of a high priest at the time of the tabernacle, which is very profound because Jesus resurrected as the high priest of our new covenant, seated at the right hand of our Father, making intercession for you and I. It's a powerful thing. And when he appeared to Peter and John while they were fishing at the end of the Gospel of John, they saw him far off and didn't know that it was him at the shore until he spoke. So that's a powerful thing just in itself. So here's what happens. These two disciples are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, from Jerusalem to Emmaus and they're talking about what has just happened to Jesus. Jesus had just been crucified. They had witnessed this, and Jesus appears to them on the road. And when he appears to them, they don't know who he is. His physical appearance again had changed. And it says that Jesus says to them, why are you sad? Because their countenance was down. The things they were talking about were obviously sad because their master, their teacher, their rabbi had died. He had been crucified by the Romans. And, and what we find out about them is that they had a theological misunderstanding, misinterpretation of Old Testament writing that led them to being sad. That's really important to note because Jesus shows up and he says, why are you sad? And their response is basically like, have you been living under a barn? Okay, I mean, are, are you lost here? What, man, have you not heard what's been happening in Jerusalem? And they're, of course, referring to the crucifixion of Jesus. And then this is what they say in so many words. He wasn't who he said he was. Now, what do they mean by that? This is what they mean. They believed that Jesus had come in the lineage of David and that he was going to reestablish the kingdom of David in the earth, possibly even overthrowing the Roman government. You'll even see that sometimes where Jesus would do mass miracles with huge crowds. It says they tried to make him a king instantly, but he would go off into seclusion and pray because he knew that it wasn't his proper time. He wasn't going to be exalted in the position of a king that way. It wasn't going to be men who exalted him into the role of a king of kings. It was going to be God who exalted him into the role of king of kings at the end of all ages, putting things, all things under his feet, every knee bowing, every tongue confessing, Jesus Christ is Lord. So he was walking with them and they're telling him he wasn't who he said he was because they misunderstood scripture. And here's what it says. It says that from Jerusalem, to Emmaus, Jesus walked with them and gave them the proper interpretation of the law, of the prophets, of the Psalms, all the way through and told them of the Messiah and who he really was and how it was all about him. Like he had said in Luke 24, he told his disciples, this is all written of me. It all must be fulfilled. And it says he opened their minds to understand the scriptures in Luke 24. And in the same way, he opens these two men's minds to understand who he was, that he wasn't going to build a physical kingdom, but his kingdom was not of this earth like he told Pontius Pilate and like he told a crowd previously, that my kingdom is within and it says that he was with them and they wanted him to stay with them, but he disappears from their sight. And in that moment, they realize who he was. And they say to each other, man, did your heart not burn within you while he spoke? Did your heart not burn within you while he spoke? What a powerful, powerful statement to mean that, well, first of all, that's a Bible study I would have loved to have been a part of. I'm checking to make sure Pastor Jose is not texting me. Uh, I, that's a Bible study I would have loved to have been a part of because Jesus interpreted the Bible and he showed them how it was about him. But most importantly, there's something different about knowledge and revelation. Knowledge is when you just gain information that someone else had. And understanding is when you learn how to teach that information back to someone else. And then wisdom is when you learn when and how to apply that knowledge. But revelation is when the Father 
takes something that's in his heart and deposits it into your heart. He takes something that was hidden from you and reveals it to you, hence the word revelation. So these men now had a revelation through the scripture of who Jesus was from a small group. All right, amen, somebody. I'm going to pretend that I had a crowd and everybody would say amen. So they got a true revelation of who Jesus was through a small group, through learning the scripture together. And Jesus gives them the proper interpretation because they had a misinterpretation. And I'm just saying to you, starting out, let's increase our faith tonight. Let's up our expectations because when we hear the word and it's revealed to us through Christ, then we get a revelation from God that changes our life. It doesn't just change what we know, it changes our life, it changes what we do. And this is what's so common about Jesus in Scripture. Even Jesus himself, when he ministered in his own hometown, they said, isn't this the carpenter's son who we know, and whose brothers and sisters we see? And he was unable to work a single miracle in his own hometown. But the next town that he went to, it says that he healed them all. He healed them all. Our faith has to increase. Our faith has to be strengthened. And when we put high expectations on God, we see God do things that are beyond our expectations. And I know Pastor Chris has said to you guys a million times because he said it to me as a young teenage guy, that expectation is the breeding ground for God to do something great if you will increase your expectations. So I'm telling you tonight, increase your expectations to hear from the Word because what I want to do is I want to show you what the Word says about why we come together in smaller groups. What's the purpose of it? That there's a theology behind this. It's not just a good idea. How many churches have tried so hard to just get a new good idea to figure out what they need to do to grow? Here's the reality check, everybody. God grows the church. It says he added to their number daily. So we have to get in line with what God is doing. We have to be led by his spirit so that he will grow our churches. They, In fact, they measured that God was with them in the beginning in the early church by two things by the word of God increasing and the number of disciples increasing. So we're going to talk about that as well. <laughs> but here's what I want to do. I want to jump into the book of Acts, and I want to talk about this for a second, this, this thought of a God idea versus a good idea. Because so many people might present small groups as, man, this is a good idea. No, this is a God idea. Because in churches sometimes, especially as leaders, you know, we try to just come up with good ideas. We see something this church is doing, and we think if we do this here, then this will automatically work. And I heard a really smart guy one time say this. He said, you know, you can try to cook grandma's spaghetti all day long, but when you are cooking your grandma's spaghetti, you always end up cooking a lame version of it. Anybody ever tried that? Your grandma had some cornbread or some spaghetti. I mean, I'm from South Georgia, obviously. I'm talking about cornbread. I know there's many nations represented in Victory Church, so... Cornbread is what I think. I know you guys have your own thing, but just think about that thing, okay? You've got your own thing. That's my thing, cornbread. Like my mom's fried chicken. Nobody on planet Earth can cook my, my fried chicken like my mom. So if I tried to make my mom's fried chicken, regardless if I followed the recipe to the T, which you don't really have a recipe, but if she did have one and I followed it, it still wouldn't taste as good as my mom's chicken. And this guy's point was, man, there's so many things, so many unseen variables that go into that we don't even think of, like the pot that she let the chicken rest in, the pan that she cooked them in, the water where she lives, that she used the flour that she bought, where that flour came from. I mean, all these little variables we don't even think about. And what he said was, as churches, we can't try to repeat someone's recipe. We just have to see what ingredients are working for people in different churches. And we have to take those ingredients and put them in our own recipe and form our own recipe of what works. So tonight, when I'm talking about small groups, I'm going to talk about Believer Church, Believer's Church's recipe. Okay. So what I hope is that you guys will be able to listen and you'll be able to pick out different ingredients that work. Okay, because I don't expect our recipe to work exactly as it does here in Chicago. Atlanta, Georgia and Chicago, Illinois are two different places with two different groups of people, different rhythms of life, 
So you guys as a church following Pastor Chris and Heather's lead, man, have to figure out the rhythms and recipes of what you do. But what we all can agree on, what works for all of us, what is the main ingredient is the scriptures and what the scriptures would say about small groups. So I'm just going to go through that. I'm just going to read some scripture to you guys, and we're going to talk about that, why small groups are so important, okay? So first, let's just go to Acts, okay? So open your Bibles. Let me check my time. It's 9.05, okay. So I'm going to go to Acts chapter 2, at the end of Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 42, okay? Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The heading in my Bible, the ESV, says the fellowship of the believers. So let's read this. It says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with generous and glad hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day who were being saved. Let's talk about this for a second. This is one of my favorite passages in the whole New Testament. And if you ever hear me teach more than once, you'll learn that just about every verse and every passage that I read from, I say it's my favorite. So that's a common little thing I catch when I... But I really do love this one. It's good. Because of that one statement that pops up, in verse 43, it says, Awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Awe came upon every soul. What is that talking about? In awe of what? In awe of God. In awe of God and His power. Let me tell you what small groups does. Number one, it brings you close, front and center, to the evidence of God's grace in other people's lives. That's point one. It brings you close, front, and center to the evidence of God's grace in other people's lives. My first experience with small groups was not long after I'd become a Christian in Pastor Chris and Heather's youth group. And I met with another group of college-age students because I'd just recently graduated high school. And we would meet in a coffee shop, in people's bedrooms, anywhere that we could meet, we would meet. And for a year and a half, there were dear friends of mine that I met in houses with, just really awesome people. My friend Kurt, my friend Tyler, Tiffany, Meredith, Devin, um, Christine. And every week we would get together and we would read scripture. And none of us were theologians. None of us had a guide. None of us, but oftentimes I led it. And I would just share with my friends cool stuff that I'd found in the scripture. And most of the time, I would just open the Bible and, and talk about what God had shown me, and then they would talk about what God had shown them, and, and we'd all just get real excited, and we'd pray for each other, and sometimes one of us would be going through a real difficult situation, and we'd, man, bear that burden and pray for each other and uplift each other and just be life to each other. And this went on for a year and a half, and what started happening was I noticed differences in their lives. I noticed differences in their personalities. I noticed growth and maturity in them. And what's interesting about that is sometimes it's a lot easier for us to see maturity in others rather than in ourselves. It's like someone comes up to you and says, man, have you lost weight? Or, man, did you do this? And and maybe it's been a gradual change and we don't see it because we see each other every, we see ourselves every day. But then when we see each other, we see the change because we've seen point A to point D rather than B, C. And it's the same with what God is doing in our lives. When we get in small groups, we're front and center to the evidence of God's grace at work in other people's lives. And what it does is it puts an awe in our soul. It puts an awe deep in our soul 
because we gain this confidence, this holy, reverent, powerful, excited confidence that if God can do it for them, he can do it for me. If God can do it for them, he can do it for me. Now, someone would say, now, why can't we just do that in the normal way that we've done things? Why can't we just continue to do things this way? Why can't it just be the way it's always been? Well, here's the reality. This is the way it's always been. At some point in American church and churches in general, meeting in people's homes became inconvenient. Meeting together in small groups just became something that was too difficult to maintain or too difficult to sustain. Most of the time it was because of lack of submission to spiritual authority or division or gossip or things not being checked, a lack of church discipline, so on and so forth. There's many people who could sit up and they could tell you stories, horror stories, bad stories about small groups. But if we were to throw out every command of order and structure in which God gives us in the New Testament based on the abuse of others, we would have no church at all. And so when we go back to the very beginning of the church and we see that a very important thing they did was they got together in the temple, which is what you guys are doing tonight, and they met in each other's homes. And by doing that, they formed a deeper bond. I want you to know something. Man, God doesn't want you to go to church. You are the church. God wants you to go to the world. Let me say that again, just so, just in case anybody missed it. God doesn't want you to go to church. You are his church. He wants you to go to the world, which is why he said, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go all to the world, to Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea. Now, here's what's so crazy. He said, go to the end of the earth. Now, one of the things you got to understand about the Bible when you're studying it is the Bible uses descriptive language, not precise language. And at that time, Jesus is in the first century, and he knew that the men he was talking to didn't believe that the earth was round. They thought it was flat. So he told them, go to the end of the earth, which we all know now in 2016 that there is no end of the earth. But what he gave them was a mission that never ended, never stop going, because there is no end of the earth. He said, go. You don't go to church. You are the church, and you go to the world. Why do we go to the world? It's in the bottom so that they could praise God and have favor with people. And when we have those two things, the Lord adds to our number. He grows the church. He grows the church when we see more people praising God and gaining favor with outsiders because that's what small groups will do. There's three things we do at Believer's Church in small groups. We care for each other, we disciple together and disciple each other, and we're on mission together. We go out and we meet not only in homes, but in schools, in restaurants, in, at lunches. We have small groups because it causes us to get in deeper relationship with each other. It causes us to know each other beyond the casual Sunday morning, the casual superficial relationship that it's all about. How you doing, brother? Pretty good. How you doing, sister? I'm okay. But most of the time, we're just coding it and filtering it. We're having to filter our answers in our lives to people that we're a part of a body with. The scripture says that you're a body. You're not a gathering. You're a body. It's a gathering, but God calls it his body and his bride. Stop going to church. Join the body. Be a part of the body. The body says you have many gifts and members, many gifts, many members, many functions, and each one of you represent those things. Romans 12, one of my favorite passages, says that when you received the grace of God, you also received a gift of God that was deposited in you, meant to be used as a gift, a spiritual gift in the body that is meant to give you fullness of joy for the good of other people and for the glory of God. It's used in you for the fullness of joy, the good of others, and the glory of God. And when you are in community and in groups, smaller groups, what happens is you get out of your row and you get into a group and you experience life with people. 
you actually know what's going on with them. You actually help them and care for them. And you praise God together. You mourn with them when they need to mourn. You laugh with them when you need to laugh. But here's what's so awesome. Because you have such tight community and you're meeting out in your community, your community begins to take note of what is happening and you gain favor with all the people. You gain favor with all the people. Because they see, not only do you get to see the evidence of God's grace at work in each other, but the outside, the world outside of your four walls gets to see what God is doing through you. That's point two. When you do small groups, the world outside gets to see what God is doing inside each and one of your hearts. And what that does is it creates this hunger within them. That leads to God adding his number because the Bible says as they see the goodness in your life, your good works, it will lead them to repentance. As people see your good works, it leads them to repentance. And you gain favor because you're out on mission. Doing what? Doing the things the church does. Caring for widows. Caring for orphans. Caring for the poor. Feeding those who are hungry. Clothing those who are naked. Visiting those who are in prison. We are a going organization. We're not a staying, secluding organization. We are not a people that are labeled by a title called the church. We are the church. We don't go to church. We go to the world. And we get outside of our four walls and we get in deeper relationship with each other. And when that happens, God adds to our number. Any organization that's not growing is dying. Period. Any organization that's not growing is dying. And so whenever we look at this scripture, it says that they had awe in their soul. Why? Because they saw the evidence of God's grace in each other's lives. And it gave them confidence of God's grace in their own life. And then it gave them favor with people outside of their church because they saw what God was doing inside the church. And that caused hunger in people who were outside the church to want to be inside the church. And when that happens, God adds to your number because that's what it's all about, everybody. That's what it's about, Victory Church. It's about Jesus being praised. It's about Jesus being exalted, Jesus being glorified, and the way that the church exploded in the very beginning was by meeting in the temple weekly and by meeting in each other's homes weekly, breaking bread together, enjoying each other's company, holding each other accountable, calling each other to greater. So I'm going to tell you something. You can't hide in small groups. You can't sit beside someone week after week after week studying the scriptures, scriptures calling people into accountability and hide. There can't be hidden sin in your life. There can't be issues that you haven't dealt with. Maturity in your life as a Christian that hasn't been dealt with. That's why Paul said, man, I wish you would leave the spiritual milk of repentance. Man, so many of us are on a roller coaster of repentance. My God, I'm preaching! (laughs) That's what Pastor Chris would have done. I'm preaching this right now. So many of us are on a roller coaster of repentance. Roller coaster of repentance when we keep drinking spiritual milk. You know what the picture of that is when Paul was talking to that church and he was saying, I wish you would leave spiritual milk and move on to solid food. He was calling them adults who are still breastfeeding. He was giving them the picture of adults still latched onto their mother's breast. He said, move on and mature and grow up into solid food. And that's what happens when you get in small groups together. That's what happens when you get in deeper community together and deeper relationship together. And you call each other to greater. Because here's what happens. Here's what happens. This is my last point. When you get in small groups, the focus is on Jesus. Because you see his evidence in each other's lives. And the world sees him working inside what you guys are doing. And they see the work you're doing outside. Consistently invading neighborhoods. Doing acts of service. Acts of kindness. Acts of mission. Feeding those who need it. Clothing those who need it. Visiting those who need it. Caring for those who need it. Watching over those who need it. People see that consistent invasion of the kingdom. And the church explodes. God maximizes the good you do so to lead as many as possible to repentance and they come to him. They come to him. I'll tell you something that's powerful. The Roman Empire, one of the things that led to the collapse of the Roman Empire was a massive plague that took place. A massive plague. And it had all types of effects on that empire. But before Constantine converted to Christianity, which is a 
very popular topic in church history. Let me tell you what began that. What began that was a massive plague hit Rome. And many of the wealthy and many of the people who could fled the major cities because they didn't want to die from the plague. And while they were running out, although they were being uh, persecuted at the time, the Christians were running in. While everyone else was running out, the Christians were running in and caring for the sick. I'm going to tell you something, guys. The church exploded. Why? Because the rest of the world, the outsiders, they saw their good works. But not only that, because they couldn't be threatened. They didn't fear death. They rallied around the fact that they served a risen Savior and that His mission and command to them was to go into all the world. And they couldn't be stopped. There was even a Roman official one time. There's a letter. It's still in existence today. His name was Tacitus, who wrote about the Christians. And he said of them, you can't intimidate these people with threats. They don't fear death. They're different. They're peculiar. And isn't that what the Bible says we should be? Peculiar. A royal priesthood, a chosen nation. See, this is what happens. The focus gets back on Jesus. People see Jesus at work in a group of people. And here's the thing. When we divide, man, we multiply even more. We're like a, a cell that divides and then divides again and then divides again and divides again because when we divide, we can conquer more ground. When we divide, we can be planted in different neighborhoods and different communities surrounding your city. And you can be out there doing mission and making a difference. And the focus gets on Jesus because we keep it on Jesus. We talk about Jesus. We study his scripture. We ask him to reveal himself more deeply to us. And here's what Paul says. Paul says in Corinthians that from glory to glory to glory, when we focus on him, when we fix our eyes on his glory, from glory to glory to glory, we are changed into his image. I heard a pastor say one time, you become what you behold. Whatever you focus on is where you'll find yourself. Whatever you seek, you find. Whatever you ask, you receive. And whatever door you knock on, it will be open to you. And I'm telling you, not only will you see the evidence of God's grace at work in each other's lives, but people outside of your community will see God at work in your lives, and they'll praise God. And you'll gain favor with outsiders. They may not even believe what you believe, but you'll gain favor with them because you're a consistent going force. Because you get the revelation. I don't go to church. I am the church. I go to the world. You get that revelation. And as you as a church, in smaller groups, call each other to focus on Jesus. You hold each other accountable. You build each other up. Mourn with each other when you should mourn. Laugh when you should laugh. I mean, God just begins to do incredible, great powerful things among you. And you know what happens? Awe comes upon every soul. And I'm going to tell you why I opened talking about the road to Emmaus. Because I think that's the only other time that it really describes what this means, the awe upon every soul. It's when your heart burns within you. It's when your heart burns within you. And you guys know what I'm talking about because you feel it when you're in the middle of an amazing worship service. You feel it when you see someone's life genuinely touched. You feel it when you hear good preaching. You feel it when you're alone in your car listening to your favorite worship music. You get that awe, that burning inside your heart. And what if I told you that you didn't have to experience that alone? That feeling you feel when you're sitting alone in a pew, or that feeling you feel when you're sitting alone in your car, you can feel with people who you get to know. Me personally, I've been a part of the same small group now for two years with people that on Sundays, because we're all moving in and out so fast, I never would have had the depth of relationship that I have with them now. And here's the reality. Us meeting together in a home is not where the real community comes from or the deep relationship comes from. It comes from the relationships that are formed and the things we do outside of those groups, that we call each other throughout the week, hey, you want to grab lunch? Hey, praying for you. That we text each other when things are going on in each other's lives, and we help, we cook food, we, we show up, we're there, we're the body. We don't just go to church, we are the church, we go to the world, and we stop going to church, and we join the body. All will come upon your soul, your heart will burn, and God will do great, great things in y'all's church.
All right. Okay, so I'm I'm 30 seconds behind you, and so uh, Pastor Jose, if you guys want to send some questions, uh, you can. Um, if not, then uh, we'll finish up here in just a minute. If nobody has any questions, I imagine next week there's going to be a lot more questions because tonight I wanted to just lay out the theology behind it and just preach to you what I felt like God laid on my heart. Um, so next week is going to be a lot more practical. We're going to talk about a lot of the ingredients that I talked about earlier, uh, things that are working here for us that help us do small groups. Because like I said, the thing that I believe has stopped the priority of small groups in the church uh, just has been the lack of convenience, the lack of rhythms that work with it. And you guys have to figure those things out for yourself and your church. And I'm going to do you know whatever I can to help. So... Um, like I said, I know I'm 30 seconds behind, so I'm just kind of talking at this point to wait until uh, Pastor Jose has uh, some questions. So I'm going to pray just to conclude uh, the word, and then we'll hang around here just for a moment, and uh, we'll answer anything that anybody sends, okay? So Father, we love you, and uh, God, I'm so thankful for this church. I'm thankful that you sent uh, Pastor Chris and Heather, to these wonderful people. I know um, the impact they've had in my life, and I know that they're making a great impact in these lives. And God, I just I want to hear the testimony of Victory Church. I want to hear about them and what they're doing and the lives that are being changed because they're dividing and they're multiplying and you're adding to their number and that there's this obvious awe that comes upon their souls. We ask you for that for their church. We ask you to just man, fill them with power, fill them with the power of your spirit, that signs and wonders would follow them, that as they break bread in homes and meet it together in church, that they would just see your, your grace in each other's lives, that there would just be the evidence of you working. Um, God, we just ask that. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right. All right, so I think I've waited enough time. No questions. Perfect timing, Pastor Jose. Well, thank you so much, uh, Victory Church, for watching me on a screen. I'm sure it was as strange for you uh, at the beginning as it was for me, but honestly, within a few minutes, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was just trying to think about you. So um, hope you guys have a great night, and I look forward to seeing you right back here next week. Love you guys. Be blessed.